Hey guys, how's it going? It's Jay, and what I got for you today is the Sony a7C II Beginner's Guide. That's right, I'm gonna go over this camera for you guys that are new to photography, new to video, new to cameras possibly, or just new to Sony cameras. I'll start from the beginning. I'm gonna go through how you put the battery in, stuff like that, charging it, memory cards, all that. Then I'll show you, you know, go around the camera body a little bit. Then I'm gonna show you how the camera works when we turn it on, you have to set it up. There's like an initial setup process. I'll show you that real quick. And then we'll get into how to use the camera. We're also gonna go in the menu system a little bit and I'm gonna show you some of the key features in the menu that you might wanna change, or at least definitely need to know that they're there um, in case in the future you wanna change. That's pretty much like the blueprint for this video. But first, I just wanna say congratulations on your new camera. This really is an awesome camera. I've been waiting a long time for the A7C II, so I'm super excited. Let's just get right into it. All right, guys, so when you take it out of the box, this is pretty much what it looks like, camera body and you get a battery in there. Now, I'm not 100% sure because I'm borrowing this one from Sony, so and it's like a pre-production model, so I don't know if it's gonna come with a charger and a cable. So it's not the biggest deal in the world, guys. You can get that stuff fairly affordable. You could use a cell phone charger to charge the battery in the camera, so you could probably use what you already have. Um, but below the video in the description area, I'll have links for all the different chargers and stuff. I'll have like the, the uh, Sony charger, like the really good one, and then I'll have cheaper ones that you can use. You know, you just plug into the wall with a USB PC cable. So for starters, looking around the camera here, we got the mode dial here. So this is the mode dial. Now again, uh, I recommend just putting it on auto if you're new to cameras, new to this camera. Now I'm not saying leave it on auto, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying put it on auto for now, like so this way you can get out there and start shooting. If you know how to use these other modes, by all means, go into the modes you already know. But if you're new, just just trust me, just put it in auto for a little while, go out there, you know, after this video, start using the camera a little bit, and you'll see, you'll be like, oh, okay, I, I see what he was talking about. I'm gonna wanna put it in shutter priority mode or aperture priority mode maybe, or you know what, for this, I might need full manual mode. So just keep that in mind, um, but I want you to have fun using your camera, especially when you first get it. And like once you're comfortable, absolutely, you could start moving it to program auto. It's a more advanced auto mode. Program auto will allow you to change a lot of settings. Auto Auto mode won't let you change much at all because the camera's like doing all the thinking for you. Program auto, the camera's still doing a lot of the thinking for you, but it gives you a lot more leeway uh, as far as features go. You can change a lot of different things in program auto. Now, aperture priority. Aperture priority lets you control aperture. All right, so the way aperture works is there's a diaphragm inside the lens and that's called the aperture diaphragm and it closes and opens just like your pupil. And the, you know, and basically when you control your aperture, you're controlling how much it's closed and how much it's open. That's what aperture does. Now S stands for shutter priority mode and shutter, there's basically this shutter mechanism that goes in front of the sensor and it covers the sensor and then it comes back up and exposes the sensor. The amount of time it takes for the shutter to do that is known as shutter speed. That's right, shutter speed. So that's what shutter priority mode does. It allows you to control the shutter speed. Now, manual mode will allow you to control the shutter speed, the aperture, and the ISO like all independently. In shutter priority and aperture priority, you can also control the ISO. So then now we have custom modes one, two, and three. These are awesome because you can set the camera up for three different modes. So for example, if you like shooting sports, you can set one up for sports. Uh, number two, you could set up for like portraits or something. And number three, you could like set up for, you know, a studio environment or whatever you're into. You you know, it could be like astrophotography or something. And what's cool about these is you can just turn to that setting and then bam, all the settings you have configured. Like you could have the camera comp with all sorts of settings different than the other modes and it'll just pull them all up immediately. So imagine if you're taking you know, landscape photos and a bird pops up and starts flying in front of you and you have to change the settings to like sports mode to try to capture the bird or action or whatever. Well, if you have it set on your dial here for that already, you could literally be taking landscapes and just go like this, boom, sports, brrr, and start rattling off and capture the bird. So these are tools, guys. You have to look at this stuff as like tools. 
and utilizing the tools makes a lot of sense for you know harnessing the power of the camera especially if you have to change a lot of settings very quickly and that's where these custom modes really come in also below the mode dial we have this sub mode dial so this is where you can select s and q which stands for slow and quick motion video so we all know what slow motion video is but quick motion is like you might have seen it like a lot of people do the gopro footage with quick motion like going up a chairlift and you'll like go up to the from the bottom of the mountain to the top of the mountain in like five seconds and it's like really fast that's quick motion video Video. So you can actually configure that in the menu and dial in those settings, you know, specifically for what you need. And it's very powerful. So you can also do turnkey time lapse in this camera. So it will record the time lapse and save it as a video file for you on the camera. You can also use the camera as an intervalometer. Uh, and take photos in time-lapse mode as well. So it does both. You also have video mode here. So this is video mode. And then if you switch here, that is photography mode. You can see that little white line, how it's moving. I'm not sure if you could see that from straight up. But so anyways, I'm going to put the camera in photography mode to start. Now we have a shutter button here and this shutter button is a dual stage button. So when you press it a little bit, it'll engage the autofocus. When you press it all the way, it'll actually take the photo. And this is the on off switch right here. It's the toggle. Now you also have a command dial here. They're calling it on the front of the grip, which is awesome because now you can control this dial here on the front. You got this one here on the back and then you have another dial here on the back and then this dial pad also turns. So you have a lot of options. So you can have one set for aperture, shutter, ISO, you know, whatever you want. You can, you can custom configure this camera in a lot of different ways. So if you're coming from Canon or Nikon and you want it the same as that, for example, some people like the shutter up front, some people like the aperture up front. Now you have a record button here to start recording. And up here we have a speaker. This is a little speaker. This is a little indicator to let you know where the sensor plane is. So if you have to ever measure from the sensor plane, that's what that symbol is. So on the top here, you have like a smart hot shoe and that's where you can put like devices like this. Now this is a really high quality mic that Sony just came out with and I was using it. You heard the audio quality in my review if you watch the review and you could, it sounds really good and it has a lot of different direction uh, options here so you can record you know from behind the camera and in front of the camera if you're interviewing somebody and you're pointing the camera at them it'll pick up your voice and their voice but anyways this will actually slide right in here and it electronically connects and it'll put the audio right into the video file for you with no cables so you don't have to use any cables now up front here you have two speakers that's the stereo speakers right there and then over here is the af illuminator and it's also the countdown timer so if you have the self timer set that'll blink when it's counting down we've got this nice grip here so looking at it on the back we have like i said another dial here Got the menu button here. Now you got the viewfinder here. Now this little adjustment is for your vision. If you wear glasses like me, you're probably gonna need to turn this to make sure it's nice and clear. We have an AF button here that you can configure. Function button, you got a dial pad. Now again, this pad spins, but it's also a four-way directional pad. There's a center button in here that, that is uh, for selecting or enter. You know, when you're in the menu system and you have to select, you hit the center there. Now you also have a garbage can, which is the C2 custom button. And then you have a playback menu button here. And then of course the screen comes out. I have it in armor mode right now. So you have nice protection when you have it set this way. But if you swivel it out, you can swivel it like this. You could swivel it like that and now the, now it's in like selfie mode so if you're recording yourself and you want to see yourself you can do it that way and then you, of course you can close the screen this way and now the screen's facing out all right so looking at it from the side here we have the usb-c port that's where we're going to charge it in a second we have the microphone if you have a cabled mic you would plug it in right there you have a headphone jack if you want to hook up headphones you got the micro hdmi if you're going to a monitor or like a ninja recorder and then you have a uhs2 sd card slot all right guys so this is the card i'm using it's a pro grade v90 card and you know i just got it when it was on sale this is a great card i, I also use sandisk cards and i also have lexar cards as long as they're v90 you know whatever you know you just get the one that's on sale basically so this card actually goes in let me just put it in it goes in facing this way like this so with the like logo and stuff towards you and it just clicks in like so so if you click it like that it, it just comes out a little bit so then you can grab it like so all right close that down 
Now let's get the battery in there. So on the bottom here you have this door and that's where the battery goes. So here is the battery. This is a Z100 battery. All right guys, so when you wanna put the battery in, it goes like this, like so. And notice this blue lever here, that is what holds the battery in. If you need to take the battery out, you just gotta pop that blue lever and it pops up like so. There we have it. And the door, you have to actually slide over to lock. Now this little door here, you see this little door here? That's for a dummy battery, so that that's like rubber. It'll actually peel back for the cord to come out if you're using a dummy battery. I'll have that linked below as well if you guys wanna use a dummy battery. But uh, I would probably just use the power source here, the PD power, which is what we're gonna do right now. So we need to charge the battery. So let me get my USB-C cable here. And it's just a regular USB-C cable, except this one supports data as well. And I'm just gonna plug it in to the USB-C port, like so. And now that orange light, you see that orange light that just came on? That lets you know that the camera is charging. Now, when that orange light goes out, that's how you know that the camera is fully charged. All right, so we don't need that anymore. That's how you go about charging the battery. All right, so now we're up to mounting a lens. So let's look at the front of this thing a little bit here. So the first thing we're gonna do is take off the body cap here. Now, this is your full frame sensor. Be very careful. You don't wanna ever leave that exposed, you know, like when you're not using the camera, you always wanna have a body cap on or a lens. Now, this is one of the kit lenses that you guys might get with this camera. It's a really good lens, actually. It's a 28 to 60. It's very, very sharp. Um, and it's very compact and very lightweight. All right, guys, so to mount this lens, you just have to line up the white dot with the white dot on the flange there. And let's see how it sits in there. And now if you twist, listen for the click. Hear that click? That click is this button right here. See this button? This is the lens release pin. So if I press this button in, now the lens will unscrew. And you can see the pin right here. That's the pin. Watch when I press that, you see the pin moving? That's how the lens stays on. So the, when you hear that click, that's that pin going into the lens. So now the lens is permanently mounted there. So let me just take this back off and I wanna show you another lens really quick. This is the lens that I used a lot when I was doing vlogging and stuff like that. This is the 20 millimeter F 1.8 G lens. I'm just gonna line up the dots and twist it. And that's what this lens looks like. So. This is a really nice lens as well. I'm just gonna use this lens for the demo here because I have a couple of things that I wanna do during this uh, video. So this lens does not have a zoom because it's a prime lens. So all you have is the focus ring. Now, this lens also has a focus ring, this little one here. You can see this, this is the focus ring on this one and this is the zoom ring. You know, once you open it, this is the zoom ring and then you got the focus ring here, this little one. So this lens only has the focus ring. This ring here is actually for the aperture. So that's not for zooming, it's for the aperture. So I just leave that in auto and I control the aperture on the camera. I don't really like using the aperture ring myself, but if you wanna do aperture throws and stuff, it is cool. Now guys, some lenses will have switches on them like this. This is an autofocus manual focus switch. This is a custom button. By default, it's focus hold. Uh, it just depends. And then some lenses like this one that are fancy have a click and declick feature for the aperture ring here. So that's what this is, just in case you're unaware. All right, guys, I think we're ready to boot this thing up. All right, I just wanted to take the lens hood off so when I flip this up, it's a little more stable. All right, guys, let's turn this beast on, shall we? Let's gotta swivel this toggle here to the on position, pretty straightforward. And let's flip this beast up. All right, so we just need to select our language. I'm gonna select English and set accessibility functions for screen reader. So this is if you're visually impaired. Now I'm, I am kind of, cause I have glasses, but I don't need it to read the screen for me. So if you are visually impaired, you know, if you're like near blind or whatever, and you, you just can't see text and stuff like that, this is where you can go and set that stuff up. I'm gonna do not now, but it's really cool that they put this right at the beginning. So if you are visually impaired, you can find this really quick. And uh, just go, if you are, just go to set there and that's where you can set that stuff up. I'm just gonna do not now. Now, privacy notice, it's talking about biometric data. What that means is the camera actually can save faces on the camera and then you can prioritize those faces. So those stored faces are considered like biometric data. So that's what it's warning you about there. I'm just gonna click this center button here as like, okay. 
Now it's asking you to connect to your smart device. Guys, I have a dedicated video on that. It's called the Sony Creators app. I'll have it linked below in the description area. So it's it's not rocket science, but it does take like a little bit of time uh, setting up the different settings, Bluetooth, handshaking and stuff like that. So I made a dedicated video for it. So I'm gonna skip this. And if you guys wanna do that, which I do recommend doing, um, just check out that video and I'll walk you through it. It's pretty straightforward. So I'm just gonna click do not connect here. And it's just letting you know that you can connect it in the future. No problem, okay. And notice how I'm touching the screen. So you can touch the screen or you can use this to navigate, this directional pad. So I'm just gonna set the area date and time. All right, 728. All right, there we go, August 13th, 728. And yes, like I said, I got this camera a little bit early because I'm borrowing it. So, all right, so I'm gonna hit okay. Now it's telling you about the, it's warning you about the auto power off temperature. Now, the camera has an option to set it to high. And what that means is the camera body itself will get like a lot hotter, but it will record way longer when you have this set. So I highly recommend setting it. The uh, Sony recommends you have it on a tripod or, you know, or a gimbal or something when you're doing this, because the camera does get quite hot, but it's not so hot where it's gonna burn you or anything. So. You don't have to have it on a tripod or whatever, but they recommend it. So it's just because if it touches your cheek or whatever, it might be like, whoa, you know. So keep that in mind. I'm just going to hit set and I'm going to hit OK. All right, guys, so this is talking about gestures. So if you swipe left and right, it'll actually bring options in and out for you. And if you swipe up on the bottom, that will bring up the function menu. So it's just letting you know about that. And here we are. So now watch when I swipe. See how it just brought those settings in? And you can swipe and they go away. And now if I swipe up, it brought up the function menu. And if you swipe down, they go away. So that's how that works. Now I just wanna put the camera back in auto mode here. All right, so here's auto mode. And we have a couple of different options here. This is intelligent auto. And here is the scene selection mode. So again, you remember I, I told you to set it to auto if you're like new to the cameras and stuff like that. And again, and I'm, I'm serious guys. So, but if you go in here to the options in auto, this is where you can actually dial it into the specific scene that you're in. Now, if you're in full auto, the camera will detect if you're taking a picture of a human and it'll like put it in portrait mode automatically. But this is where you can go to hard set that stuff. So you got portrait, you got sports and action. Fantastic. Put it in sports and action. If you're taking sports shots, you don't have to know what any of the settings mean. You just put it in this mode and you're ready to go. And uh, really, really cool. You got macro, landscapes, sunset, night scene, night portrait and back to portrait. So that's basically the scene selection for auto mode. I'm just gonna put it intelligent auto mode for now. And there you go. And when you're in intelligent auto mode, you could notice up here on the left that it's, it's trying to identify what the scene is. And because I'm pointing the lens at the desk, it's pitch black, it's showing like a candle there, meaning low light. Also notice that little symbol next to it that's green. It looks like the camera's on a tripod. That's because it senses with the gyroscope in there that the camera's not moving. So it thinks it's on a tripod. Again, it's just because it's in full auto mode. It's like telling you this stuff. And on the top there, that's the memory card, how many photos I can take with the current settings. It's currently set to JPEG mode. It's set to 33 megapixel. AFA is the autofocus mode. Over here is the battery life. This is telling you that the subject detection is on and it's set to humans. Now this here, the M-E-C-H stands for mechanical shutter. So I have the camera set to, you know, with mechanical shutter, that's how it's set by default in photography mode, because I just initialized the camera. So it's it should be exactly how it is when you take it out of the box. Now down here, this is your ISO, that is the sensor sensitivity. It's gonna be on auto uh, by default in auto mode. The F number there is the aperture, so that is the size of the lens diaphragm, and F2 is pretty large, it's almost wide open. This particular lens actually goes to F1.8. Um, it's at F2 right now, and the shutter is at 2.5 seconds, which makes sense. Again, I'm pointing at the desk, so you know it's pitch black. Now, if I swipe over here, we got a bunch more settings. 
So up top, that's actually a shutter button. So if you press that, it acts as the shutter button. It'll focus and take the photo, that top little circle there. Right below that is a record button. So in photo mode, you can record video, but in video mode, you can't take photos, just so you know. Um, but if you're in photo mode, you could just hit record either by the button on the top of the camera or that button, and it'll start recording, which is really convenient. Now below that is the subject detection, and it's set to human, so you can cycle through the different options there. Now below that is your touch operation. Right now it's set to touch to focus. That's what that stands for. Below that is the playback menu. You could see it's the same as this button right here. Now over here is the creative mode, the creative options. I'll show you that in a second. Um, up here is the drive mode. So drive mode, this is important because if you wanna take continuous shooting like rapid fire shots, you would need to change that here in the drive modes. And notice on the button here, there's a, there, on the dial right here on the left side, that is also drive mode. So if I push right here, that'll bring you into drive mode as well. So there's multiple ways to get to this stuff, guys. Note, if there's arrows next to it, that means that you have options left and right. And if you look on the bottom, you could see the different options. So you have high speed plus, high speed, medium speed, and low speed. So those are all your continuous shooting options. Then down below that, you have a self timer. So you can set that to 10 seconds, five seconds, or two seconds. Below that, you have self timer continuous. So you can set that for, let's say, 10 seconds, five shots. This is awesome for family portraits. Think about it. Your family is sitting there. You have the tripod set up. You're the camera guy, of course, right? So you hit the button, you hit the uh, timer, you hit the shutter button, and, it, and then the, the timer starts counting. So you get 10 seconds. So you run, you go sit with your family. It's going to rattle off five shots. So you know how someone's eyes are always closed when you're taking family portraits? Five shots. You just got it like one of those shots is bound to be good, you know? So that's a great feature for that purpose. And uh, I would recommend using that. Now, the rest of this stuff is grayed out because of the mode that we're in. So I'll show you that in a minute. All right, so let me show you what this creative option is. And this is available when you're in full auto mode. So right now it's set to off. You see how it says off? So when you go in here, now we have these four different options. So this option here stands for background defocus. So that means that if the background, if you're taking a photo of somebody, the background's gonna be nice and blurry. Now, if you want the background sharp, you would set it to clear. So if you're taking landscapes, you would wanna have it set to clear, for example, and then, you know, the foreground and the background will be sharp. So that's what that, that does. And what the camera is actually doing, by the way, to make that happen, it's changing your aperture. So if you were taking a portrait defocused mode, f1.8 f2 would be where the camera would probably set it if you're taking a landscape like clear mode the camera will probably put it at like f16 for example so it's going to stop down that f stop number all the way to f16 which will close that aperture diaphragm and it'll give you that larger depth of field that's what that does now this one here will control the brightness. So this is basically like exposure compensation, which is how you would normally do it in the more you know advanced modes. So you can change the brightness up and down. This is great if you need to adjust your exposure when you're in full auto mode. Now, this option here is basically the same thing as brightness and stuff, except it's color. So you can make your images much cooler or much warmer, depending on the lighting conditions that you're in. So this is a really nice feature as well. Now, this next one is creative look. So this is where you can go and you can like customize what your photos are going to look like, you know, because the camera is processing your photos if you're in JPEG mode um, in particular. So you can actually change that. Now auto will customize based on the scene selection that the camera is detecting. So if the camera detects that you're taking landscapes, it'll probably set your creative mode to like a landscape option. You know what I mean? And when you're using auto. So there's Vivid, Vivid 2, you got all sorts of options here. You got PT, I believe that's for portrait. And then you have standard, which is what I normally use. So I'm just gonna leave it in auto. I'm just going to hit menu to get out of here. And now notice how it says on. So the creative mode is now on. I'm going to just turn that back off. And it's just warning me, you know, hey, like, are you sure you want to turn that off? And it's just giving you that warning. So I'm going to hit, don't show that again and click OK. All right. So now see how it says off there. All right. So now if I swipe up, guys, this is the function menu. And you have a bunch of different options in here. This one here is steady shot. 
So that stands for sensor stabilization. So you can turn that on and off there. And you can also get to the function menu by hitting that FN button. Now here is subject detect. Now if you go in here, you have all different subjects. And notice how there's that arrow there. That's more options. If you need even more options, hit that little arrow. Now you got animals, birds, you got animal here, you got birds separately, you got insects. This is what I used for the dragonflies in my review, if you guys watched that. You got cars and trains, and you got planes. So I'm just gonna leave that set to human. And let me go back into the function menu. Now here is your focus modes. So you have autofocus single shot, autofocus auto, and autofocus continuous. And then you have direct manual focus and manual focus. So let me show you how these work. All right, so this is just the basic of how you take a photo. So I have my little dummy here, my dummy subject there. And if I press the shutter button, you could see how it's focusing on the eye. It's kind of hard to see, but there's a little green box on the eye. And if you look at the auto up there, it's actually showing a picture of a baby. So it thinks it's like a small child that I'm taking a photo of. And that's the autofocus. So now if I press all the way, it takes the photo. Now, if I go into the function menu and I change this to autofocus continuous and I press the shutter button, it's gonna continually autofocus. So if I move this around, it's gonna track it. You see that? So it's actually tracking the subject continuously when I have the shutter halfway pressed. And then if you take the photo, it'll take the photo. Now, the key difference between the two, if I go back to AFS mode, once the focus is locked, you hear the beep, that's telling you that the focus is locked. So now if I move the subject, you can see the green box is still there. So what's cool about AF single is you can focus and then reframe the shot and then take the photo. So that's what one of the main advantages for AFS is, is being able to focus and then reframe. Continuous, you can't really do that because it's constantly focusing. Now AFA, what that stands for is automatic. So this will automatically detect if you have a subject moving. So if you see here, it should detect that I'm moving this because there it goes. So now it's, it's switched to AFC mode and now it's tracking it. So it was originally in AFS mode and because of the subject was moving or the camera was moving, it switched to AFS mode. So again, it's in AFS mode and see how it's staying in AFS mode. And if we move it around enough, it'll eventually switch to AFC mode. There it goes. See how it switched to AFC mode? That's how that works. So I recommend leaving it on AFA for now if you're a beginner because it'll automatically detect if your subjects are moving or if they're still. So, but I just wanna let you know that's how that works. Now, if you go to direct manual focus, that basically works like single shot, except it'll allow you to dial it in once it's focused. So now, again, the focus is locked, right? But if I change the focus ring, now I can dial it in a little bit. So this is great if you're, and then once you get it where you want, you take the photo and it'll take the shot. Now, obviously that was out of focus, but this is great if you're taking pictures of like flowers or something is where I tend to run into this a lot. It'll focus on like the front of the flower and I want it in the middle of the flower. This is the feature for that. So you basically focus it and then you can dial it in to move it, like move the sharpness to where on the flower you want and then you take the photo and that that's what dmf is for great feature and then of course you have full-fledged manual focus as well so i'm just going to put it back on afa like so all right so let me put it in video mode for a second because i wanted to show you a couple of things in video mode here let me just flip this back up. All right, guys, so notice in video mode how the screen looks similar, but a little bit different. So there's no there's no shutter button there. You don't have that option. Um, you got focus map. That's different. That's basically an assistant for focusing. It'll help you focus in manual focus mode. That's basically what that does. And record button. You have self timer for video. That's what this button is right here. And notice the audio meters on the top. And notice how it says standby there, and it gives you like how long you're gonna be able to record for as opposed to how many photos you're gonna take. And right in between there is your actual video settings. So by default, it is set to HD 60, not 4K, just so you guys know. And on the bottom here, you have similar options to photo mode. 
So in the function menu here, I just wanted to show you, you have options for zebra display, which will help you with exposure. If you're using S-Log in particular, it'll help you with that type of stuff to figure out where proper exposure is and stuff. And it's more of an advanced feature. Now here we have steady shot settings and I wanted to go in here to show you that there's another option for video called active. Highly recommend checking out active. It does crop in a little bit, but it gives you extra stabilization. So it's definitely worth it, especially if you're hand holding, walking, using the camera, active works really well. So that's what that is. I just wanted to show you that. Also, if we go into touch function in shooting, I just wanted to show you how you have a tracking option and you have touch focus. And also down here, you have an auto exposure. So you can touch auto expose if you want. So wherever you touch, the camera will auto expose. And then you can turn touch off right there. Now, if I put it back into photography mode. All right, so now I'm back in photography mode. And I just wanted to show you a couple of other features here in the function menu. So what this is, is touch function in shooting. So right now it is set to off. But if we scroll up, notice you have touch shutter. So touch shutter is awesome. You just touch the screen wherever you want. The camera will focus where you touched and then take the shot. That's what touch shutter is. And you can also add exposure, auto exposure on to that. So if I go to the right here, now I have touch shutter plus auto exposure. So I'm just gonna leave that off. You got touch tracking and then you have touch focus. I'm gonna leave this on touch tracking by default. And, or, or you can just shut it off down here as well. I just wanna show you that. If you don't like to touch stuff and you wanna shut it off, it's right there. So I have that set to touch tracking. Now, if I go back in the function menu here, this is silent mode, guys. So if you want silent shooting, if you're going to church or a wedding and you want the camera to be silent, this is where you can go to enable that really quick. It's in the function menu by default, which is quite nice. Now this will put the camera into crop factor mode. That's what this stands for. It's set to auto by default, but you can hard set it. So if you put a crop factor lens on, it'll automatically switch to crop factor mode, but you can hard set it in here to on if you want. And crop factor is great if you're recording video and you want like a little extra zoom because you'll still maintain 4K and you'll have like more zoom. So. All right, so just let me go back into video mode here, and I just wanna show you how that works really quick. All right, guys, so listen, if you wanna record video, you just hit the record button, and now it's recording video. So it gives you that beep, it says it's recording, and you can see the audio meters moving there um, as you're recording. And notice there's a stop button there, it switched to a square. So check this out, guys. If you just touch, it'll focus on where you're touching. So you see that? It's just switching and it goes nice and smooth. Now that little bit of zooming that you're seeing is actually focus breathing. You see how it looks like the subject is actually moving away? When it goes out of focus, it looks like the subject's moving away. And then it's like coming closer. That's focus breathing. There's an option in this camera to turn focus breathing compensation on. And that's awesome. And if you do, it'll crop in a little bit, but you won't get that zooming effect with this lens. This lens is supported. Not all lenses are supported, but the 20 millimeter G lens is. And that's what focus breathing compensation does. So to stop recording, you just hit the record button again and it'll stop recording. So let me switch this to a more advanced mode like program auto. And I just wanna show you a couple of more features in here because when you're in program auto mode, you get more features like focus area. And focus area is this second one right there. And you also have white balance below that. So I'm just gonna hit the function button here and I'm gonna scroll over to focus area. So it's also located in the function menu. So I'm gonna click that. All right guys, so think of focus area as what you're limiting the focus area to on the screen or on the sensor. So wide area focus covers like 95% of the sensor pretty much, so almost the whole sensor. If you go into zone focus, you see how it's just like the center area, there's like those nine boxes, and you could move those around to, you know, see so if you want to just focus on somebody's head, you know, in an interview or something, you could set it up there in the center and it'll ignore the rest of the screen, like it won't focus on anything else. And notice how it says set focus point on off, it's kind of hard to see, but that's just telling you if you hit this button here, it'll turn the, those boxes off. And now I can't move the focus like grid around anymore. If I hit this center button again, now I can move it. You see that? So if I press it now, and now if I hit this these options, it's actually gonna do what the button is, you know? So it's gonna change my display mode. 
it's cycling through the different display modes. So that's what that does. Now, if we go back into focus area, you have center fix. Now, when I was taking the pictures of the dragonflies, I was using center fix um, because it limits the focus to that little tiny square. So all I had to do was get the square on the dragonfly basically, and it would like pick up the dragonfly's head and it was just good to go. But it ignored like the whole rest of the sensor. So it made it a lot easier for the camera to focus on what I wanted. Again, these are tools guys to help you get the job done, whatever it may be that you're, that you're up to. So now here we have spot and notice how it has the arrows. So you can go left and right to change the size of it. So if we go to small, you could see that focus point, how small that is. So that's really gonna limit the focus to a very small area. And if you touch around, this one actually moves when you touch around and it'll maintain that area as you touch around where the center one doesn't do that the center it just doesn't so this is pretty cool and if you you know you again it has the center button here to stop it so now when you touch it's not going to move you see all right so going back in there we also have this expand spot. So expand spot is very similar to the one we just had, except it will reach out a little bit beyond and it's great for tracking moving subjects. This is a really good feature for that because it, the focus points will bleed out a little bit from the, from the focus area. So it, it just helps. Like if you're, it's, it's hard to really track moving subjects sometimes. So if you're like missing them just a little bit, this will expand out and like help keep it in focus. So great for moving subjects. Now, another option I wanted to show you here is metering mode. Metering mode is very powerful. If you watched my review, I actually changed the metering mode to highlight tone priority when I was in the car at Big Kev's barbecue because I was holding potato salad up under the sun and it was white potato salad. It was so bright, it was like blowing out. So I put highlight metering mode on and when I held the potato salad up, it uh, exposed for the potato salad. So my face went dark and the potato salad looked perfect. So highlight tone priority is awesome if you're trying to photograph like a bright white wedding dress, for example, uh, frothy white water, um, a light bulb, a uh, fire, like anything that's crazy bright that you want to expose for, highlight tone priority will make Make sure that those highlights are protected. Now, the other options here, we have entire screen average. So it'll average the entire screen and try to expose properly, like taking everything into account. Uh, spot metering is just a very small spot in the center of the uh, thing by default, but you can move the spot around if you want to your AF point. There's an option in the menu to change that, but it basically will expose for just a very small area. And that's a powerful feature too, if you're having a hard time exposing for a specific subject, like a light bulb, for example, you could use spot meter for that as well. And you can change the size of the spot meter. Now center weight average is a good one for like portraits and stuff because it'll emphasize the center area more than the rest of the screen. And then we got uh, metering mode multi. Now multi, will still emphasize the center a little bit more than the rest of the screen, but it's basically averaging the whole screen with a little bit of emphasis on the center area um, for how the camera will expose. So again, metering mode decides how the camera exposes for an image. So you can manipulate that in here with these tools and you might need to change that stuff at some point. Now, white balance, if you go into white balance here, Auto works pretty darn good, but I do recommend hard setting it if you know the conditions you're gonna be in. So when I was in the woods during the review for this camera, I was using the daylight option and I just had it locked into daylight because I was going into shadows and stuff like that and I didn't want the white balance going all over the place with my skin tones, so I just locked it down. But you got all different options in here, shade, cloudy, incandescent lights and so forth. You got underwater, auto white balance underwater. You have color temperature, so you can go in here and just dial in your color temperature. So if you're using studio lights, you know, you could match those lights, for example. And then you have custom white balance in here. This is where you can go and you have three separate custom white balances, which is awesome. If you're doing like weddings or something like that, you can have a custom white balance set for inside the church, let's just say, and then have another custom white balance for outside, you know, under the tent or whatever. And then you can switch that in there um, if you're, you know, a professional doing that type of stuff. And then here's the creative look. So you can change that in program auto mode as well. But notice how there's way more features here than there was when we were in
full auto mode. I'm just going to put that back to wide area focus, like so. All right, so that's pretty much a crash course into how this works. All right, so let me just show you aperture priority mode really quick. So right now I am focused on the subject, and if I turn this front dial, you can see the aperture number changing. It's F4, and that is the aperture. You can see it just lit up orange, and now I'm changing it. Now it says F1.8. All right, so now if you look at the background, I have a light there now. You can see how the background's nice and blurry, right? If I move this even closer, background's super blurry. Take the photo, and that's at f1.8. So now watch when I dial this down to like f11. You can see now the background is much sharper. So if I put it like all the way to f16, you can now see like all that stuff back there. So that's basically what aperture does. It changes the depth of field and it also controls how much light comes in through the lens. Now what I mean by that is if you look at the ISO here, when I press the shutter button down uh, halfway just to focus, see how it says ISO 6400 there? So the ISO is a lot higher than it was. Now watch when I go down to f1.8. Now remember, f1.8 means the aperture is wide open. So it's wide open now, so a lot more light can come in. So now if you look, it says ISO 100. So the lower the ISO, the cleaner the image you're gonna get. Now, let me switch to shutter speed. Shutter speed is right here. So right now it is set to 1 250th of a second. And by default, this dial on the back where my thumb is, is changing the shutter speed. So if I was doing sports or something like that, you would want this at like 1 500, 1 1 1,000th of a second. When I was taking photos outside in the review of Jace, I actually had this set to 1 1,000th of a second. I was doing it a slightly different way, which I'm not gonna talk about in this video, but basically I had the shutter speed at 1 1,000th of a second, and that will freeze the action. Now, if you want motion blur, you could lower the shutter speed to like one fifth of a second, one quarter of a second, if you're on a tripod or something like that with like flowing water. And when you take the shot, it's gonna leave that shutter open for a longer period of time. And the moving subject will pass in front of the sensor and it'll create that blur. And that will give you the motion blur. And that's how you do that, by slowing down the shutter speed. Now, if we put the camera into full manual mode, now we get to control like all the settings independently. So let me just put the ISO to a hard number. Let me set it to like ISO 100. Now that I have the ISO off auto, this is now a meter. So you can see how it changed from a meter. Watch when I, when I put the ISO back to auto, now it's an exposure compensation. So you can actually change the exposure comp by turning this dial. So you can see here it's plus one. And if I turn it, you can like lower it to like minus two. That's what the exposure comp does. Um, it's not making, it's not changing anything because I'm in manual mode right now, but if I was in regular shutter or aperture or program auto, it'll lower the exposure or brighten the exposure if you use the exposure comp. That's what it does by default. Matter of fact, let me just switch to aperture priority mode and now watch when I change the exposure comp. You see how it's getting brighter and it's getting darker? That's what the exposure comp does. But in manual mode, if you have the ISO set to a hard number, the exposure comp goes away and it switches to a meter, watch. See that? Now it says MM for multimeter. So it's telling us that it's overexposed by plus two. So we need to either increase the shutter speed or increase the aperture, f-stop. See how it's getting darker? So we're allowing less light to come in. That's why it's getting darker, guys. Remember, we're closing down the aperture diaphragm. We're making that hole smaller, so that's why it's getting darker. So let me put it back to f1.8, and now watch when I increase the shutter speed. So right now the shutter is open for a third of a second, so that's gonna allow light to come in for a third of a second. So if we limit the time to a quarter of a second, fifth of a second, see how it's getting darker? It's gonna allow less time for the light to come in. So now we're at like 1 60th of a second, and you can see it is underexposed by 0.7. So, if we go into the ISO, we can raise that up, something like 400 or so. Now we're at plus one, you can see there, so I can dial down the f-stop here a little bit, and now we're at zero. So that is a proper exposure. And you can control the exposure with ISO, aperture, and shutter speed when in full manual mode. That's how that works. All right, guys, I'm in photo mode. Let's go into the menu here. Hit the menu button. All right, so 
On the left hand side here is the main categories you could see here. If you hit the function button, you can actually go through the different categories. So up top we have my menu area. This is where you can go and you can add items that are in the menu into your my menu area. So some of the items are a little bit hard to find like focus breathing, for example, you might wanna add that into here. Uh, you know, different settings depending on what your use case is. So if we go down one, this is the main area and I love this area. This is new on the new Sony cameras. It has this main area and it's pretty much like 99% of the settings you're gonna need most often are right here. And you can just touch them or you can use this navigation pad to move around. So this is where you can go to format the card. This is your shutter speed, aperture, exposure comp, ISO, JPEG quality, so it's set to fine. You can set that to extra fine if you want maximum quality. Raw, you can set to compressed, lossless, you have small, medium, and large, or uncompressed raw. I'm just gonna leave it uncompressed. And then file format, you can pick either JPEG, JPEG plus raw, or raw. I'm gonna use raw, that's what I like to shoot at. All right, so moving on here, if we go to image size, this is where you can change the image size. So you can take smaller, lower resolution images if you want in JPEG mode. Now aspect ratio, this is where you can change like the shape of the photo you're taking. The sensor itself is a three by two, so that's what it is by default, that's the whole sensor. Now if you go to four by three, that's more of an eight by 10. It's closer to a square, but not quite a square. 16 by nine is like, you know, your widescreen TV that, you know, like for movies and stuff. And then one to one is a square crop. So these will change your resolution guys. So just keep that in mind. 33 megapixel is for three by two. If you take a square photo, it's gonna be much less resolution because it's cutting off the sides, but you can do it in camera if you want. And that's what aspect ratio is. This is just the shoot mode that you're currently in. We're in manual mode. This is your drive mode, which we already talked about. That's where self timer is and stuff like that. But I didn't talk about it when in manual mode. So we have a lot more features now. Remember these features were grayed out before in full auto mode. So bracketing, bracketing is awesome if you like to take HDR photos like I do. So you can basically take multiple images at different exposure values. So this is great for really high dynamic range scenes. So if you're in like, uh, you know, like an abandoned building and it's like crazy dark, and then it's like really bright over here where there's no windows and stuff, that's a high dynamic range scene. And that's what would be a great opportunity for HDR photography. So how I normally set that if I'm doing that is I set it to two EVs, three images or five images, depending on how extreme the dynamic range is because the dynamic range on the sensor is actually really good with just one shot shooting raw. But sometimes you do need more than that. So three normally covers it. Uh, sometimes you might need five though. So that's bracketing. And then you have drive mode, single bracket. I never use that. It's the same as bracketing, except it takes one shot at a time. Regular bracketing will just rattle off all the photos for you at once, which is nice. I much prefer that. Now you also have focus bracket. This is a new feature. Now focus bracket is really for like macro photography when you have to stack images. So when you're at those high magnifications, the depth of field is like razor thin. So what you have to do is you have to take multiple frames at different focus points, and then you stack those images together like in Photoshop. Like you could merge the focus into a stack in Photoshop and it'll combine the stack for you and give you, you know, to make sure like a bug, for example, is sharp from the front to the back of the bug. But if you're taking macro photos, you'd have to be at like F, you know, a really high F stop to get any kind of depth of field at that magnification. So that's where focus stacking comes in and focus bracketing makes that super easy. You can take up to like 299 shots in that mode, which is amazing and super powerful feature. And that's where that is. It's in the drive mode area. Now you also have drive mode uh, for white balance, if you want to bracket white balance and dynamic range optimizer as well. I'm just going to put it back to single shot there. Now you do have flash options there if you have a flash attached and the white balance is set to custom. So I want to put that back on auto. This is also really cool because you could see all the settings like at a glance. So I didn't realize I had the white balance set wrong. And again, you got to focus area and focus mode there. All right, so now watch what happens when I switch this to video mode and I go to menu. 
So notice how there's two main screens here. See how there's a main one and a main two? So video, you get two mains. So if you go over here, this is where your frame rate is. And if you go down here, this is your file format. So this is where you go to set it up for 4K. This is what I recommend using, the HS4K option. That's what I always use. And if you go over here, this is your actual like bitrate quality. So this is your file size quality also. So 100 megabits, 422 10-bit is the best quality for this particular mode. So I'm gonna set that. And up here now, now that I have that set, you can go up to your frame rate and you have two options for 4K. You got 60p or 24p. Now my camera is an NTSC model camera. If you're seeing different frame rates here, like 50 and 25, for example, that's because your camera is a PAL camera and you might be located over in Europe or something. I'm in North America, New York. So there's an option in the menu to change the camera from NTSC or PAL and that's why your frame rates might be different guys just so you know so let me just go back there so now if i just go back to hd here i just want to show you how you can change the frame rates now you have more options you see that so you have 30 24 and 120p for slow motion video that's where that is so let's just select 120p and let me go down here and i just want to show you now the record settings how you have to change that to 100 see that so now I have that on 100 and it's good to go. So now if we go back in here to 4K, click OK. Let me go up and change the frame rate to 60. And if I go back down here to record quality, notice how it's on the like the lowest quality. So if you want the best quality possible, you're going to need it up here at the 200 meg option. So that is the best quality. So now if I change my frame rate it will remember. See how it's at 100 now? It remembered my setting. So we're good to go. It's at 100. Now this option here is Gamma Display Assist. This is helpful if you're shooting in log. And the this is just what mode the Gamma Display Assist is set to. And if you're shooting log, the image looks really flat on the screen. So this will make it look a little bit more contrasty. And down here we have audio options. You got You got wind noise reduction here. And this is picture profile here. Now, we used to use this to get to S-Log, but on the newer cameras, you could see how it skips from 6 to 10. You see that? So the picture profiles are not the same as they used to be. I mean, they are, but they're missing all those other ones where the S-Log is and stuff. And that's because it's right here now on main 2. You see how it has log? So this is where you go to enable log shooting. So right set to off so if you turn it on it'll put it in flexible iso mode and we got s gamut 3 cine s log 3 which is what i use if using s log and that's where that is now you can also embed a lut and in the menu you could actually load that in there and so you can have a custom lut configured on the camera for you so if there's a particular look that you like um, it, you can actually load it into the camera and you can see what it looks like while you're recording well, that's just awesome that that's built in like that and we have a couple other feature features here file settings you can go in here and change the file setting like naming structure so if you go in here and you change it to title for example you can rename the file so it says like a7c2 underscore for example and then it'll sequentially count so if you're doing multiple cameras, you'll be able to identify, oh, this file was shot on the a7C2, you know what I mean? So I, I highly recommend going in there. I did that on all my cameras, the a7 IV and so forth. They're all set up that way. The a7C is set up that way. And you go into title to do that. Pretty straightforward there. And we got steady shot settings. We already talked about that. This is where you can turn facial recognition on and off. Now, when I was recording that video, holding up the food in front of the camera at uh, Big Kev's barbecue, I turned facial recognition off. So when I was holding food up in front of the camera, it would just focus on the food. You see how it's not focusing on my hand right now? That's because I have facial recognition on. But if I cover my face, it will focus on my hand, see? So that's why I had it shut off, so I can just hold the food up and I didn't have to wait that second for it to, you know, switch from my face to my hand. And that's where that is.
So those are the key differences between video mode and photography mode. And the menu is different depending on what mode you're in. So as we're scrolling through here, you have different autofocus features for video than you do for photo. So just be aware of that when you're going through the menu. If you're looking for a specific feature, you have to make sure that the camera is in that mode in order to see the feature in the menu. So for example, if I scroll down, you can hit the function button here to tab through like I was saying. This is where all the shooting stuff is. And there's a lot of options in this menu, guys. So if you go in here, if you just go to the right, you keep going to the right using a directional pad, then you can go down. Here's your movie settings. So now here is where your S and Q settings are. And that's the other option on the mode dial. The settings are in here to configure that. So if you go into the S and Q settings, this is where you can go. And if you go over here, this will be your quality. So I'm just gonna put it up to the best quality possible. And then if I go to frame rate, this is where you can go and change your frame rates. And it tells you what it's doing down here on the bottom. So right now it's saying we're going to get 2.5 slow motion because it's 60 frames per second because I'm in 4K quality. So 60 frames is as fast as it can go. If I want more slow motion, I have to switch it to HD and then I can choose 120 here and I'll get five times slow motion. So watch what happens when we change the frame rate. You see how it's changing? So now it's switching to quick motion. So it's at 12 times quick motion, 24 times quick motion, right? Because it's 24 frames per second at one frame. So that's gonna be 24 times. And if we go up here, it has these presets built in. Three times quick motion, for example. So that's how that works. And then we can change the frame rate there to 60p. So now we have 60 times quick motion. You, you see what I'm saying? Pretty cool how that works. Now, if we just hit the menu button, we can go back hit it one more time now time-lapse settings this is where you can go to set that up and you got a couple different options in there so we have frame rate settings in here so that's where you can change that stuff and we got record settings so you can set what kind of quality you want I'm gonna set that to the maximum quality and then video light settings, if you're using a video light, that's a more advanced thing that you can uh, play with if you want. By the way, guys, if you hit the garbage can here, it'll explain what a feature is if you don't know what it is. Sets the video light illumination setting during time-lapse shooting. So it's just explaining what that setting does. So if you see the little garbage can with the question mark there, that's how you know if you hit the garbage can, you'll get more information. I'm sorry I didn't mention that earlier, but there's a lot of options in this camera. And if you don't know what they are, you could hit the garbage can and it'll explain it a little bit. It'll give you an idea at least, you know? So I'm just gonna hit menu. So we got log shooting, proxy settings, gonna skip over that. Lens compensation I wanted to go over. This is where you can go and turn on the breathing compensation. You remember how I told you the this lens supports breathing compensation? This is where you can go and turn that on. So great feature, very powerful feature. It also has distortion compensation. I'm gonna put that on auto and the other two are already on auto. So this will basically correct lens flaws for you. Now, depending on what lens you're using, um, these features aren't always all there. Not all lenses support all these features, just so you know. The newer lenses tend to support more of this stuff. Now going down here, we have the media option. This is where you can go to format the memory card and display media info, like how much space you have left, stuff like that. This is where you can go to save the camera memory. Remember those one, two, and three on the mode dial? This is where you can go to set that. You can set that independently for video and photo and S and Q. So it's actually nine presets. Now silent mode settings, that's in here. Release without lens, that's enabled. That's for if you're using fully manual lenses with no electronics. The camera doesn't really know you have a lens attached, so you have to have that enabled. Anti-flicker set, if you guys are having flicker issues um, in photography mode, you can go in there and play with that. Audio recording, you can turn that on and off. So if you have a power zoom lens, you can control the zoom speed and stuff like that. You can also set a custom button to zoom if you want. Shooting display, this is where you can uh, overlay a grid line and stuff like that on the screen. It's off by default. So you can put like the rule of thirds grid on the screen and it makes it helpful to like compose your image better. That's what grid line display is. There's a couple of different options in there. You can see it says rule of thirds grid, but there's a couple different options in there that uh, work pretty good. Now emphasize record display. What that'll do is it'll put like the red box on the uh, 
on the edge of the screen to let you know you're recording. It's a little more obvious that you're recording as opposed to just a little REC. Um, that's that little red text. So that's what emphasized record display does. Now here is the auto framing settings. Auto framing, as I showed you in the review, is how like the camera will kind of act like a cameraman and it'll follow you around. It's amazing. And in here are the features. So this is how it is set by default. And uh, it works really well. I'm a big fan of that feature. All right, guys, so here's where you can go to manage your LUTs. And by default, it's Rec. 709 is what it's set to, and that will make the S-Log footage look like pretty contrasty. So it works pretty good set like that. But you have the user LUTs, so this is where you can go to manage your user LUTs. Now this camera also has a soft skin effect. So if you want your skin to look a little smoother, you can enable that. It does help with like bags under your eyes and stuff. I noticed when I had it on, on a different camera, it was another Sony camera, it was on by default, the ZV-1 Mark II, I think. It came with it on by default. And my face was like so soft looking. And that's what this is. It's like a beautifying effect. It works pretty good. All right, so in here is the autofocus manual focus settings, and this is where you can change your transition speeds and stuff like that because we're in video mode right now. So your your autofocus transition speed is how long it'll take from when you're focused, like say on this face, to the background. Like how long will that transition take? So this is where you can go to change that. If you want it really long, you can put it on one. Um, if you want it like reasonable, right around five is pretty good. I had, it was on five before when I was doing that video test, so you, that's the speed of five. Now, subject shift sensitivity. Responsive is default, but if you want it to lock on subjects, you could move it over more towards one, and in the middle is just like, you know, a middle ground there. But by default, it's set to responsive. Now, AF Assist, what that means is, it's very similar to direct manual focus. So when you're recording video, if you turn the focus ring, if you have this enabled, it will focus for, it'll actually adjust the focus while you're recording. So that's what this feature is for. Very powerful. It's good for doing like macro type stuff in particular is, is where I, th I think I would use it most. You got focus area. You can change a couple of things in here as far as color and stuff like that. Subject recognition, there's a bunch of different options in here. You can change the which eye, you know, it focuses on by default. Right here, face memory, this is where you can go to pick different faces, add faces in there. If you're trying to, you know, you wanted to prioritize your kid, for example, on the sports field, you can load your kid's face in here and it'll prioritize that, you know, your kid. Focus magnifier is great if you're doing manual focus. It'll it'll like zoom in for you so you can see much closer on the screen and it'll help you fine tune the focus much easier. Now down here is your playback area. This is where you can go and you can check out your images. You can look at them. You can rate them. You can delete them. You can edit them. And you have a couple of different options. You can crop, rotate, photo capture. That will actually extract a photo from a video clip. And I have an actual dedicated video on that. Um, so if you want to extract a photo from a video clip, you would use photo capture. Then you would navigate to your video and select what frame you want, and it'll turn it into a JPEG for you, which is awesome viewing here. Now, if you do time-lapse shooting you can, uh, and you're taking photos, you can play that back on the screen to see what the time-lapse looks like. Now, if you take a time-lapse video, that will just play normally. But if you're in the photo mode, which is a more powerful mode because you get full resolution, you could shoot raw, and that will give you a lot more power for editing if you're doing like a really hardcore time lapse. But if you want to see what it looks like, you can change the settings in here for how it plays back. Because depending on how your time lapse settings were set up, it might be playing too fast or too slow, for example. So you can dial that in there. Now, focus frame display, I kind of like this. I'm going to turn that on. And when you're in the playback menu, it'll actually show where the camera was focusing. So when, when you're scrolling through the images, you'll see like a dot in there. As, as a matter of fact, if I go in there, you could see it right here. See that little dot on her eye? That's what that feature does. It shows you that dot. Otherwise, you wouldn't see it. I mean, you would be able to tell if it's sharp or not, but you wouldn't know where it was focusing. So I recommend turning that on. It's a cool feature. 
All right, so down here, we're now in the network area. This is where you can go to set up the smartphone connection. Like I said, I have a dedicated video on that. Be sure to check that out. PC remote function, you can actually tether the camera and use the Imaging Edge desktop to remote control the camera from the computer. Tethered shooting, very powerful feature. That's where you would set that up. USB streaming, this is where the USB streaming settings are. So you can set this for whatever you want. If you have the bandwidth, you can set it to 4K, which is just amazing. That's where the streaming options are. While you're streaming, you can record to the memory card as well. That's disabled by default though, but this is where you would go to enable that. Now you got Wi-Fi settings here. Bluetooth settings, this is where you would go if you have a Bluetooth remote control and you need to turn that on. This is where you would go to do that. Network options. Now here is the customization area or the setup area they hold it, but this is where the custom settings and stuff are. So this is where you can select your language, area, date, and time. Now remember I was telling you about the frame rates earlier, NTSC and PAL, this is where that option is. So if you want the same frame rates as me, because yours are different, you can change your camera to NTSC here. That's where that option is. Now this is where you can go to reset the camera. So if you go in here, this will reset the camera. If you wanna put the camera back to factory default, which is what I did right before I started this video, you gotta do initialize. So initialize will just blank it out to how it came from the factory. So I'm just gonna click menu to go back. Now save and load settings. You can actually save the settings of the camera to your memory card, then take the memory card out and put it in another camera and load those settings. So if you have multiple cameras or you have a team of people and you want the cameras all set up the same, this is where you would go to utilize that feature. Now, Operation Customize. This is where you can go and customize the camera. And remember I told you it's incredibly powerful. You can customize the camera for photography and video separate and playback. So uh, very, very powerful. So let me just go in there real quick. It's just giving me a warning there. I'm just gonna click OK. So now you can see over here on the left, it's showing you different parts of the camera, and then it's showing you the different buttons that you can customize. See that? It's also showing what they're set to right now. Focus hold on the lens, and the you know what the different turn you know gear, the different turn dials do, and stuff like that. So guys, you can go in here and you can customize so much stuff. It's incredible. And again, you can do that for photo and video separately and the playback menu. You can also change the function menu. So this is where you can go and customize the function menu. So you have one for photo and one for video. You can independently change those. Now different set for still and movie. I recommend turning this on because when you switch from photo to movie, you might not want to have all the settings carry over. For example, focus area, white balance, things like that. So you know, aperture, shutter speed, all that. You might have it dialed in for video, and when you switch to photo, like, you don't want the settings going back and forth. You want them independent. I do anyway. So I go in here and I enable all this stuff, and when I switch from photo to video mode, you know, video is set how I had it set, and you don't have to worry about that stuff. So highly recommend doing that. Click OK. Now display screen, when you hit the display button, this will control how many different screens there are. So these are the different screen options that show up when you hit the display button. And you can also change that for the viewfinder, which is this guy here, the viewfinder. All right, so dial customize. This is where you can change how the, what the dials do when they turn, you know, if you wanna swap them around and stuff like that. Touch operation. Now touch panel settings. When you're using the electronic viewfinder, the screen is considered a panel. So you can actually touch around the panel while using the viewfinder to change your focus and stuff. That's what the panel settings stand for and the pad settings. Accessibility, this is where you can go and you can do the screen reader if you're visually impaired or you can enlarge the screen as well if you're having a hard time seeing it. Now we got finder monitor settings. Monitor brightness I wanted to show you. This is a very powerful and important feature. If you guys can't see the screen outside because it's really bright out, you can just, if you have this bar highlighted, see how it goes down? If you're up top here and you hit the select button, you can change it to sunny weather mode. Now you see how bright the screen got? It's so much easier to see the screen outside when you have it set to sunny weather mode. So I recommend setting it there. You can also change it here a little bit. You can go plus two and minus two, which is nice if you're in like a really dark spot and you, want to, you don't want the monitor to be so bright, you can lower it there as well. 
It's going to put it up one like that. Now display quality, I'm going to put that on high. Finder frame rate, I'm going to put that on high as well. Actually, I'm going to leave that on standard, but if you want the 120 frames, you can set that up to high. Now monitor flip direction. So when you have the monitor flipped open and you're, you know, in selfie mode, this is where you can go to change the direction of the flip. So for example, you might, it might look backwards to you and this is where you can go to change that. Sometimes it looks like a mirror. Sometimes it looks the opposite of a mirror and you might not expect to see what you see. And this is where you can go to change that. So uh, I get a lot of those questions. People say their, their face is backwards on the screen and this, that's where you go to change that. Remaining shoot time, auto review. So auto review is when you take a photo, it'll automatically pop up on the screen for a couple of seconds after you take the shot. I have that off by default. It's actually off by default because I initialized the camera. But if you take photos and you want them to pop up on the screen for a second for you to like look at, just turn this on. Now auto power off timer. I like to raise that a little bit to like two minutes or five minutes. One minute is a little bit quick when it shuts the camera off automatically, but you know, you can play with that there and auto power off temp. We have set to high. We already set that. So you got some audio settings in here, USB settings, external output. This is where you can control your HDMI output settings. All right, guys. So the auto dust function, I recommend going in here you can clean the sensor if you want, but more importantly, uh, shutter when power off. I'm going to turn that on. And what that does is when you power off the camera, the shutter will close. So when you change a lens, the shutter is now in front of the sensor. So it will help keep dust off the sensor. So I highly recommend turning that on. And, uh, you know, you always want to have it, the sensor covered, but when you're changing lenses and stuff, it's nice to have the shutter there protecting it a little bit. So I recommend turning that on. Pixel mapping, like uh, sometimes pixels will like go dead or whatever, they, they go bright and stuff. So pixel mapping will like find that and it'll like cancel them out. It's very helpful for astrophotography and things like that. You might have to do that every, you know, every once in a while. I've never really noticed it, but I don't really do much astrophotography. Now version, this will tell you what the camera firmware is set to. And software updates and stuff will be in here if you want to update the firmware. These days, you put it on the memory card, you insert it, and then you just hit software update. And uh, it's pretty straightforward. You got serial number, privacy notice, and we are back to my menu. All right, guys, so that is pretty much it for the Sony a7C II Beginner's Guide. Now, if you guys have questions, please don't hesitate to ask below in the comments area. I will absolutely try my best to help you out. Um, I didn't want this video to be like forever. So, you know, it's still a really long video, but I could go into detail on every one of those features in the menu and this video will be like four hours long. So it's just, you know, you could hit the garbage can. It'll tell you what the feature does. If you guys have questions, just ask in the comments and I, and I can help you out, you know, so not the biggest deal. But listen, if you guys, you know, found this video helpful, if you can give me a thumbs up, I'd really appreciate it. And it would be really cool if you subscribe. And don't forget, Below in the description area is going to be all the links for the stuff I was talking about, you know, extra batteries, the charging cords, stuff like that. And I'll have those other tutorial videos linked below as well. All right, guys, I will catch up with you next time. Take care.